Hi everybody and welcome back to the vlog series of the Center of Law and Economics at ETH Zurich. My name is Alexander Stremitzer and I'm the Professor for Law, Economics and Business at ETH. Two-thirds of Fortune 500 companies in the US are incorporated in Delaware. Delaware is a tiny little East Coast state just across the Delaware River. So this begs the question, how did Delaware become the market leader in corporate law? I'm talking about this topic today with uh, Professor Sarat Sanga from Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, um, who has just recently written a new paper, The Origins of the Market for Corporate Law. Sarat, welcome to the CLE. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be interested in this topic? Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in the Pritzker School of Law, where I, uh, my research uh, topics are mostly in contract law, contract theory, and corporate law as well. So this was a project that I was uh, really interested in because as most uh, anyone who knows, who's even familiar with US corporate law will appreciate that uh, one state, Delaware, has come to dominate uh, this, uh, this market for corporate laws. In principle, anyone can incorporate in any state, regardless of where they're actually physically located, but it turns out most choose Delaware. Many have asked why, but uh, few have asked how this came to be even that uh, we can choose the law that governs our corporation, especially if you think about it uh, his, from a historical perspective, this is not the way it always was. At the beginning of the, when the United States was founded, it was essentially assumed that corporations would be confined to the state in which they were uh, incorporated. Meaning if you incorporated in New York, you could conduct business in New York and you had no inherent right to conduct business outside. And this was because that sort of, we sort of lost this idea over time, uh, but in the 18th and 19th century, corporations were fundamentally viewed as creatures of state law, of state legislatures, creations of them. Uh, this is sort of no longer the conception of them legally or even economically that we have, but at the beginning of the Republic, that's what it was. And so this project tries to investigate the origins, sort of how did we go from this sort of state of autarky, if you will, to this complete freedom of choice. So what did you find in your paper? So I found uh, two sort of surprising things throughout this uh, project. The first was sort of a legal uh, result. And it's sort of commonly believed, at least now by contemporary scholars, that uh, the, the creation of this market for corporate law, if you will, whereby people can choose whichever uh, cor state corporate law will govern their company uh, was uh, facilitated by, by uh, the jurisprudence of the United States Supreme Court. It turns out that that was not the case. And in fact, in case after case, after case after case, the Supreme Court is affirming and reaffirming vigorously states' fundamental right to both discriminate and even exclude outright so-called foreign corporations, meaning companies that are incorporated in another state. And like I said, this is because, at least at that time, the notion of a corporation, it was uh, thought to be essentially a public law. Uh, you'll, you, you know, you remember that uh, this was a time when, in order to form a corporation, you had to petition your state legislature to ask for them to pass a law, a charter, that giving you these certain powers. Uh, so it's really not surprising that that was the case, but this also presents another puzzle than how did it come to be in spite of all these legal obstacles. The second uh, main finding and somewhat also surprising finding concerns the rise of Delaware. So we know it's sort of this corporate superpower now, but was it always so? The answer is no. Uh, this much was well known that in fact it was this adjacent state, the neighboring state of New Jersey, that was sort of the first mover, if you will, in this market in the late 19th century. It passed a series of extremely liberal laws that enabled corporations to do things like become a holding company and merge with other companies. 
uh, which were not previously, at least generally, uh, the, the powers of a typical corporation. So this attracted a lot of out-of-state charters, and it was commonly believed that it was the fact that New Jersey later repealed these laws for sort of political reasons, which led to Delaware's success, because Delaware, meanwhile, had essentially copied New Jersey's laws, and everyone just moved there. I found that, that the actual empirical reality of the situation is much more nuanced and complicated than that. Um, during this time, it's not just Delaware, but in fact, many other states along the East Coast and even to the interior West that are copying New Jersey's laws and attracting out-of-state charters. So there's this period of 10 to 15 years when it wasn't clear who would win this charter race. Uh, one of the uh, collateral consequences of my findings is that this, uh, what I'll call a myth, that it was the repeal of New Jersey's laws that was the causal effect of, De of Delaware's rise is just a myth that's actually had nothing to do with its rise. This is very interesting. You're busting a myth here. How comes that modern day corporate law scholars have a very different account of the way how Delaware rose to prominence? And why is it that um, this account doesn't hold up to scrutiny? Yeah, well, uh, I want to give some credit where credit is due. There were a few others that have voiced a somewhat a skepticism that this was exactly the story that played out. Before my project, though, we really just didn't have much data. And so one of the things that I think was fueling the myth, especially of this claim that New Jersey's repeal led to Delaware's rise, and that's the way that Delaware became the superpower that it is, uh, in some sense was sort of too good to be false because it lined up so closely to the, to the real historical events. Um, but uh, I show that this repeal happened something like upwards of 10 or 15 years after Delaware had already established itself as a power. So I think uh, really lack of data might be the one a simple explanation of why. Another reason why, somewhat of a, a broader claim, uh, perhaps about the literature, uh, and this perhaps isn't too surprising, but I think most of corporate law, sc law scholarship is uh, uh, focused, perhaps rightly, on uh, contemporary events. And we're thinking about, because uh, there's so much to, to uh, study right now. Um, and I think it, it may have just been a, a lack of interest, really, that you know, why did Delaware come to be Delaware? You know, we've got our narrative, it sort of fits up, it sounds right, it's good enough, so let's just kind of move on, perhaps. That was uh, another reason why. I've learned from reading your paper that actually many states tried to compete against each other to become the leader in corporate law. Now, you've just described to us that Delaware at some point rose to prominence, but so did many other states before. And so the question, of course, uh, arises, how was Delaware able to preserve its supremacy in this area? Yeah, so that's sort of a two-part puzzle, right? You know, you're right to say that there was sort of this intense competition between states as each was out copying the other in terms of the innovations that they were making. You compare the laws of not just New Jersey and Delaware, but uh, states like Maine, which is in the very northeast part of the United States, states further west like Ohio and towards, more towards the south like uh, West Virginia and even North Carolina that are essentially adopting identical statutes, uh, if not even more liberal ones, and drawing in the, uh, the business of outside companies. There was this period in the early 20th century, I'd say about 10 or 15 years, where if you just sort of plop yourself down there, I'd say it was anybody's game. It would have been very difficult to guess who's going to win this uh, charter competition. Delaware, though, uh, at least with the benefit of hindsight, and I'll admit this is where things become a little more speculative, uh, but I think Delaware has a lot of things going for it. Uh, this, this sort of a potent combination uh, that uh, not every other state shared. So perhaps first and foremost was something as simple as just its physical location, being adjacent to New Jersey and so close to the commercial centers of New York and the East Coast and Philadelphia and the like. Another thing that it had going for it uh, was its size. So usually you think bigger is better, but in this case, a smaller turned out to be the more potent political uh, weapon, essentially, or a commitment device, if you will. And that's because of the following reason. Uh, it turns out uh, today, I'll just give you the most recent numbers, 
the, uh, the, the so-called franchise fees, these little annual fees that corporations pay for the privilege of being Delaware corporations and other business entities in Delaware, account for about 25% of Delaware state budget, about $1 billion out of its $4 billion budget, which is vastly more in terms of the share of revenue than any other state by a lot. And so it's thought that actually this acts as a kind of bond that Delaware has sort of politically posted to the world. Of course, if it were to lose this business, it would be a catastrophic fiscal event. And so uh, the business and legal community can rest assured that Delaware will do everything it can to maintain an attractive uh, uh, business and legal environment, which is not something that a large state like New York or California could actually ever re truly emulate because the fees would be uh, such a small portion of its budget. Another thing Delaware has going for it, which not every state does, is it actually has a separate specialized court which hears corporate law claims. They hear other types of claims as well, but the judges that staff that court are extraordinarily uh, uh, capable and uh, ex expert uh, in business matters, and so they're able to parse through complicated transactions and whatnot. Of course, it's got, at this point, we like look back on history, and now Delaware has been the leader for more than 100 years, and it's that rep it's century or more reputation, which I think is going to be uh, difficult, if uh, not impossible, for other states to emulate. The last thing I'll say about why does Delaware continue to maintain its uh, position of supremacy? If you, uh, and just to hammer this home, if you look at uh, IPOs, companies going public, uh, upwards of 90% of them are Delaware corporations. So Delaware share is only gonna to continue to increase in the future. And one of the reasons why, I thought one of the many reasons why I think, or perhaps I should say the principal reason why uh, Delaware will, I think, maintain its position for the foreseeable future is not just because it has an attractive set of laws, but because of the simple fact that everyone is there already. So you might imagine there are all kinds of positive consumption externalities, as an economist might say, as the more people consume a good, it becomes more valuable, like a language or a social media platform. So too with Delaware corporate law, this whole uh, architecture or apparatus, if you will, has evolved around it, not just top lawyers, who study Delaware law, both in practice and in law school, but also auditors and accountants and investment bankers, investment advisors that are familiar with Delaware's law in a way that they're just not so familiar with any other state. So I think it's for all these reasons that Delaware rose to prominence and its position, at least uh, barring any uh, seismic events, is uh, fairly secure. We are standing here in Zurich, Switzerland, and as you know, Switzerland is the quintessential federally organized system. Now, many cantons actually engage in intense competition, especially on the tax sector, and um, I wondered whether you have certain insights or certain advice to share with state legislatures in um, cantons how they can best succeed in the competition for business um, with other cantons? So uh, I think if there is a lesson to be learned uh, from the American experience of this market for corporate law and the competition, especially in the period that I am studying when it's sort of anybody's game, right, uh, between Delaware and the rest in the early 20th century, the principal lesson that I draw um, is that Legal innovations that one state makes, if it can be copied by other states, it will be copied by other states. And that's exactly what happened to New Jersey. Having been so successful so quickly in drawing the charter business from outside states, other states realized, hey, we could do the same thing, adopt the same law, and that's just what they did. One of the things that makes Delaware's position particularly, I think, secure is that it, it didn't stop there. It has also found a way, sometimes through luck and sometimes intentionally, to also innovate in ways that are difficult for other states to copy. So I mentioned the uh, network effects and the uh, specialized courts. All right, these are just two things that I think are uh, very difficult things to copy, at least compared to passing a statute, right? 
So if a canton wants to distinguish itself from another, I think this is a fundamental lesson that it'll have to keep in mind. It may be necessary to adopt uh, or make innovations that can be easily copied, but I don't think it is sufficient to maintain or to grow uh, one's legal base. You're, they're also going to have to do something that is not so easy for other states or cantons in this uh, case uh, to copy or emulate. Thank you, Sarat, for being with us and um, sharing with us your fascinating insights. It's my pleasure. Thank you.